big audience for what, what I'm sure is going to be terrific. Uh, ben Rochelle is easy to spot around the department. He's, uh, you can't miss him. Um, he's always banging into things with big instruments and turning them around. And, uh, uh, and actually, this all came about last semester when Ben applied for and won a faculty uh, student faculty research grant, which enabled him to uh, further explore his passion for early music and performance practice up uh, in Toronto for two weeks at the Tuffle Music Institute. So he uh, was able to explore that, and we're, we were, uh, it was really great for him to be able to do that. Uh, he also is uh, looking to graduate this year and, and pursue graduate study in early music performance. And his main instrument, of course, is the, uh, the lower guys, so that's what you'll hear mo mostly about, but it, it is fueled by this, this whole passion that he has uh, for early music. And uh, uh, we are grateful to him in the department. He's really kind of charged us uh, up with p performing earlier earlier music, performing in, in the correct fashion. He's, he's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he makes us move the harpsichord all over the place and, uh, and you know, play on, on funny looking bows and with, with terrible strings. So he'll explain all that to you. So, Ben. So uh, before we dig into the instruments, I should just preface uh, for what we mean by 8-foot pitch, 16-foot pitch, and the various octaves that we usually think of labeling uh, on the man modern piano keyboard, they're also very relevant as we explore the ranges of these various different instruments. Um, so just for reference, an organ pipe playing great C, that's an octave below middle C, is approximately 8 feet long. As you all know from physics, if you take a vibrating string or a column of air and double the length, you get an octave lower, cut it in half, you get an octave higher. And thus the terms eight, four foot pitch for an octave higher and 16 foot pitch for an octave lower, which is where most of these instruments will typically play. Also, you're thinking, okay, these look like a bunch of double basses. That's all well and good. But if we look at the vast orchestral repertoire that these instruments are used in, for example, in Mahler symphonies, they're not always playing the harmonic bass line that the cellos would have, doubling it all the time an octave lower. So as such, I'd like to propose that we refer to them as contrabasses, based on their reg register, where they usually play, in ensembles, that is. And all the other languages have contra and bass, or some variant thereof. So that, as you all know, double bass is a transposing instrument down one octave of particular interest is the <coughs> bass octave, or great octave, and the contra octave of the A big important, wonderful, wonderfully illustrated source in exploring these instruments in 17th century performance practice is a great book by the name of Syntago Musicum by composer and theorist Michael Pretorius, who wrote many of the chorales and tunes that we're familiar with. Um, particularly its second volume and appendix of illustrations. <laughs> Before we talk about the origin of the contrabass, well, this is the origin of the contrabass, the viola de gamba family. They were a concert instrument, usually typically in three sizes, played in the Renaissance, the bass, the treble, and the tenor. <laughs> Characteristics of the gamba family, played dabraccio, literally on the leg, are that they usually have six strings tuned in fourths with a third in the middle. As you'll see, they have a flat back rather than a round back, usually C holes instead of F holes, and they're quite lightly built. This thing is probably a little bit. And they have gut strings. Their bows are held underhand rather than overhand. So your fingers literally manipulate the tension on the hair. The strong bow is the push bow, and the weak bow is the pull bow. So it's the exact opposite of what we usually think of strong, weak, strong, weak. And they have very little tension, which enables them to have great resonance. This is a treble gamba, tuned as we see here, 
in force with a third in the middle. D, A, E, C, major third, G, and D. I unfortunately don't have here a tenor gamba, which would be G to G in the middle, and the bass gamba, exactly one octave lower, same tuning. Approximately the same range, size, and function as the cello, however, they are not related. Large gambas and things bigger than that were nothing new in Pretorius's time. In fact, we have things that look like double bass instruments back into the 1490s. We have an illustration here from 1518. <laughs> And an Italian traveler by the name of Prospero, or excuse me, Spanish traveler, goes to Mantua and writes of instruments as big as himself. How exactly they were tuned, how they were bowed, what settings they were used in. Yes. And we come to the characteristics of the violin family. Higher tension, thinner strings, square shoulders, a round carved back, F holes, and they're much more heavily built. Stronger <coughs> tension, bigger <coughs> sound, eventually overtakes from the Gamba family in big holes. And their bows are, as I showed you, played overhand. And they also have pointed corners. I'll refer to Gamba corners without points that are just spread off. And elaborate violin corners. The consort instruments, such as the, particularly the recorders and vials, viola de gamba, viola, same thing, different language, played polyphonic music together, usually uh, played by amateurs. In its typical six part consort, though they ranged anywhere from three to seven parts, uh, two trebles, two tenors, two basses, as one example of various possible combinations. And the thing you all have been wondering about what is a violone? It's a fairly generic term for some instrument that is large and plays low in the bass or sub-bass registers. Though of many possible tunings, G, D, F, A, the list goes on and on and on. But we often refer to, among modern early music people, if we want to be particular, a violone being in G or in D or in A, etc., usually with five or six <laughs> strings. The contrabass, as I said, is nothing new. Uh, Castiglione tells us in 1528 <coughs> that it was the deepest voice of the Renaissance vial consort. We'll see a picture of that later. I have here a picture of the range of and open strings of the bass gamma for reference. And a wonderful instrument, the G violone, tuned an octave below the tenor vial. G, D, A, F, third in the middle, C, and G. You could make an argument that it's sort of a early double bass because it can play in the contra octave. And this beast here is a violone in D, tuned an octave below the bass gamma. Same range as a modern double bass. <laughs> and you may have to sit to play a particular instrument, maybe stand, maybe you put the instrument on a small peg, maybe on a cushion, maybe on a short stool. It depends on the player and the context. We have here a picture of someone sitting to play a shorter string-length instrument, presumably of a higher tuning, and someone standing to play an instrument of a lower tuning from 1568. We have a great quote here from Michael Pretorius praising the gamba and not giving us a whole lot of useful information about what a standard tuning was. You can all read, you see that he says that he doesn't care how a particular player tunes their violin or viol so long as they can play it well, which is in the end what matters the most. And he also says that he likes to use the usual instruments on the upper parts and a great bass on the bottom line sounding an octave lower. This is again from 1619, sounding like the deep sub bass of an organ. 
Unfortunately, there was no standardization of any of these aspects of instruments, of exact sizes, of exact tunings, gauges of strings, frets, no frets for the larger instruments, uh, violin corners, gamba corners, flame holes, F holes, C holes. Even to this day, there's an incredible variation. Just run through a bunch of images here. You have, uh, from Pretorius' time, two real eyes, both six string. This is an illustration from Stagno Musico. Paired along with the other instrument capable of playing into the aforementioned Katra octave, the Thiorbo. And a, uh, some outlines of various patterns from the 16th into the 17th centuries. Note the potential gradual evolution of violin corners and F holes as the violin family takes over. These gamba family instruments stay around and adapt various ornamental, not key structural, ornamental features to survive. Six string. Five string, another six string, so these images aren't the greatest quality. This instrument was actually built for six strings, unfortunately, you can see the sixth pickle. Four string, no flat back. Not all Italian bases look like violins. Of the sloping shoulders. <laughs> and we come to a, another important illustration from Michel Caret's treatise, he was an organist, but wrote a bunch of other books, of an instrument with frets tuned in fourths, E A D G, just like the modern bass that we're all familiar with, and what looks like an overhand bow. So this was actually written. 1741, published in 1781. Here's just for an idea of scale. This poor guy schlepping this thing around the stage. And the contrabass was often used in very small ensembles, not such as we would typically assume it to be, as the only bow bass instrument, even with a lute and a singer in a consort. Right here, a Renaissance vial consort with a very large instrument playing the bottom line. And in a bunch of mixed ensembles here with singers, trombones. In a trio sonata, created 1620. In a ballet, there's a big bow bass instrument here with the orbo and a singer, the keyboard instrument. Apparently no bass gamba, no bassoon, no cello, none of that. Even accompanying song, there's a ribbon and a string quartet. So we come to the question of what is basso continuo. In case you all haven't had any history, it is a quasi-improvised accompaniment to a vocal or instrumental solo line that was realized basically at sight or quasi-improvised by some player or group of instruments to give a foundation support and context for the somatic lines. Of course, largely credited to uh, Perry and Ticini and Florentine Camerata in the 1590s. Continuo is not always harpsichord and cello. It could be a variety of instruments. Some instrument capable of playing chords, usually plus some sustaining bass instrument to, to reinforce it. Why would we double the bass line? Well, for one reason, to strengthen it, as I mentioned, and also the lower registers of a Baroque organ. Pipes are very quiet and slow to speak. Here's an example. Uh, some bowed bass instrument plus one. And 
continuo groups, not just the typical harpsichord and cello pair that we think of. You could have easily had in an opera setting two harpsichords, an organ, a bass gamba, a cello or two, a fiorbo, some other large lutes, a baroque guitar, and usually a violone of some kind, of some tuning, some general description. As I mentioned, they would reinforce the bass line if they're doubling it and highlight notes important <coughs> to the harmony and dramatic structure of what's going on, aiding in text painting, etc. For a variety of reasons, which I'll explain shortly, the player may have simplified their part from what is notated, that is, the violin player with large instruments would only play, perhaps, in certain scenes, or they may play all the time, but only play down the octave at cadences. Very Richard Nello and Aria, or Recitati, excuse me, played by two harps chords, harp, arch loop, fiorbo, another loop, cello, gamba, and strings. That's me way in the back there um, <coughs> playing that instrument. Can we get the lights? And notice how this, this group of continual instruments will continue to accompany the rest of the possible simplification of a baseline. You might do it for the player's technique. Perhaps they were a very good player, perhaps they didn't play all the time, perhaps they weren't a very good player and they would only play chord notes. Um, big, thick gut strings, especially the lower ones, can tend to speak fairly slowly if you're not careful. And you would use the lower octave to strengthen cadences or dramatic effect to certain harmonies. And, look at the lights. We have an example here from Michelle Caret's treatise again on, on playing the contrabass, and the bass only plays the most important notes of the harmony. Notes. And I have here 
essentially a, a modern day split set up for your own play. Uh, tune in fourths. But with a low C, which is a great thing to have. And seven frets, just like the goblins. So we have here these two excerpts from this treatise. And I'll play the important <laughs> Monteverdi was one of the earliest um, composers to specify a particular instrumentation uh, for his landmark opera from 1607, Lord of which we are familiar with. We consider it the oldest surviving complete and developed opera. And he calls here, on the title page, for two contrabasses, di viola, di viola meaning viola da gamba. Otherwise, he would have said viola da grasso or viola da Baracci. Uh, two famous excerpts are, are in Act 2. We'll hear Riccinello and Singer, another piece. And the 16 foot bass instrument, the contrabass, will drop out and rejoin the next Riccinello. <laughs> Oh. 
opera, there is a great symphonia, string quartet with contrabass in pianissimo. Contrabass stays around for quite a long time. It's about time I played some of these instruments. And we have here, oops, I should turn that off. An excerpt from Purcell's Mask, The Fairy Queen, a tune that loves a sweet passion. here as the Takapa aria. And I will first play the bass line, Zazzling Cello, on the GB Lonic, as I mentioned, has the capability of occasionally playing 16 foot way down low in the country. These things didn't take so long to do. <laughs> well, we're not all purists because we've got this tool of stuff with gut stream. And we're, we are playing the rope balls. Are you playing? Oh, <laughs> Sorry, I ran out. <laughs> they're, they're, they're a modern strings, and I have a modern cello. <laughs> this is not an entirely authentic performance, but one thing I'd
switch instruments and will the repeat to turn them on as they would turn on. Outside of the focus of the presentation, I would also be remiss if I did not mention another important part of the history of this instrument, uh, which is the Viennese violone or Viennese bass, tuned largely in thirds. Don't play it much. Basically, a D major arpeggio, A, F sharp, 
a D and A. You can do all kinds of cool things as you would imagine with harmonics in that particular tuning. And there's a lot, a lot of solo and solo-like repertoire in string quartets and some early bass concerti written very idiomatically for that tuning. And cello and bass parts didn't diverge in Beethoven symphonies necessarily as we think of them. We have an example here, um, Haydn, and it has a wonderful Viennese bass solo variation above the cello bass line. The ensemble distributions and numbers of various strings at any given time, or if you had, say, premiere of the Beethoven Symphony in Vienna, and a couple of years later in London, totally different distributions of instruments and performance situations, but they're all equally valid. Beethoven gave approval to both of them. And another of his um, principal bass player often was this fellow, Domenico Dragonetti, who was an absolute virtuoso and played a three-string bass, uh, which I believe was tuned uh, in either fifths or in fourths, and they changed the end of piece. And slightly into the middle of the 19th century, Giovanni Barsini, um, colleague of Verdi, often conducted many of his operas and wrote many more great bass solos. And as a point of comparison, a modern four-string orchestra lay says the instruments gradually lost strings from six to five to four to three, sometimes back to four, sometimes four back to five. These, this evolution is quite convoluted and took different paths at different times in different places in different situations. Um, sometimes when I'm playing a six-string instrument, I really wish it was four. Sometimes when I'm playing a chord instrument, I really wish it was six. Um, and the modern bass has, though there is still no standard of any aspect of string and chord construction, size of the instrument, etc., we've usually arrived at the tuning of E, A, D, G. And I must also thank the Office of Grants and Funded Research for enabling me to attend on this program, which then blossomed into what you see here today. Julie Rubczynski for tirelessly advising me, and Trout and Joel Morton for their uh, endless patience with my many, many questions, and there are many more to be asked. And of course, two strings and Gail. Thank you. They're, of course, a natural material sheet that we've got. Um, I tend to think they're worth it, but some, many other people think otherwise. And modern steel strings were largely an invention of the late uh, 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, basses, in many cases, didn't get steel strings until the 1960s or 70s. Mark? You talked about the difference between the shapes of the bodies and like mm -hmm. points on the ribs. Is there a, a sound? That Advantage to that differences, or it's just really more of a visual. It's visual. They're super, as I said, they're superficial details that the instrument takes on, sort of becoming a hybrid over time of a gamba family instrument infused with violin details. Right. Where did the strings originally come from? Like, where were, where were they made? Like, what? Yeah, where, where were they made? Uh, nowadays, most of the gut comes from New Zealand. Oh. But any further detail than that is... <laughs> 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 
let's just say it's a natural material that's carefully processed, <laughs> scraped down, and becomes. <laughs> How much are a package of gut strings? I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> It's cheaper if you buy the cow. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, for this instrument, um, the silver wild springs that's there, um, it was an invention of the, around the 1660s, 1670s. They enable the string to be thinner, yet have the same mass. So it's easier to play if it's a core of gut wound with silver or copper. Um, top string around 80, second string 100, uh, the bottom one can even be 150. Oh, so you guitar players be glad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? How did you become interested in this esoteric subject? Oh, this is my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Exposure to various concerts and uh, records when I was a little child. Apparently, I liked the sound of the crumb horn. <laughs> and uh, as many of you know, I'm curious and I'm always asking all the wrong questions. <laughs> okay, sort of working my way backwards. I don't know, maybe the next thing will be VL, medieval film. Who knows? <laughs> Mark? I know when I first met you, you were at Moore Music Camp. Yep. And came out and you played some nautical piece in your string case. And I'm just wondering, like, do you have a favorite genre to play or listen to specifically, or is it mostly classical or other things? I like Bach played on mandolin, I like it played on Baroque violin, I like medieval music, I like Beethoven, everything. <laughs> Jazz. <laughs> <laughs> Practice. Yes. Yes. Anyone else? I don't think I quite chose it, but it was sort of chosen for me when I was young. And I don't know, despite its overwhelming size, I've managed to stick with it. They needed the tallest kid in fourth grade. <laughs> <laughs> um, a little bit earlier, you mentioned um, sea holes and apples and mm -hmm. plain holes. Um, mm -hmm. Could you just go into a little bit of detail on what plain holes are? Yeah, I don't have a picture of them, unfortunately. Um, the particular characteristic um, to the Villa de More, um, they're of no great significance. There was all kinds of experimentation, various shapes, um, placement as I showed with those templates. Dr. Marash? I'm wondering, again, this sounds like what may be a long, you know, long process. Mm -hmm. What's your next steps in terms of research about this? What, what new questions have come up as a result of your research? Good question. Um, I've been particularly intrigued um, by references to a five-string instrument tuned in F, which I've been able to find very little about, um, let alone what register it played in or from what to uh, explore playing one. Um, I would also like to longer term introduce Baroque performance practice uh, to students such as yourself. And there are a whole bunch of outlier instruments, so to speak, and various um, scholarly claims, some misguided, some not, that pose a whole new set of questions or make me wonder, hmm, I thought there wasn't a double bass in France until 1707. Yet someone unearths some instrument that they claim sounds best in a given tuning from the 1580s, say. Um, there are so many different aspects of these various instruments that as soon as I look in one direction, something pops up in the other. Mark? Do you see any, or feel there could be any future like development on these kind of instruments, or do you think they just got it right and it's just going to be consistent? Well, okay, you open the can of worms of modern versus period instruments. Um, do, ins do these do modern instruments represent you know, 400 plus years of evolution in terms of technical perfection and strength of tone? Well, yes. 
Um, I would just make the argument that these period instruments, so to speak, are a different tool for a different aesthetic goal, for a different sound ideal. You wouldn't use um, a Model T to go racing. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a different thing for a different time for a different price. <laughs> Christine? If you had to recommend a couple composers or a couple pieces that kind of best represented these instruments, and want, especially the earlier ones, what mm -hmm. they're capable of, what would you recommend? To those uh, there's a lot of great repertoire um, for the Giubilone in Frescobaldi Town Zonas and so forth. Um, so it was Golden Age was the um, end of the 16th, early 17th century. And also um, very virtuosic solo divisions and variations um, on a given plain song, as it were. The list of the curious composers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Minosh, for enabling me to invade this room with all these instruments. <laughs> <laughs>